Welcome everyone uh, to this CPMC town hall about our new resource, Who Do You Say That I Am? Uh, a, a, a Lenten Faith and Action Resource Guide uh, to guide uh, those of us through a process to discern what our roles are in ministry for those who are affected by incarceration, and more than that, to help educate other Catholics in the pews around what incarceration is, who we're incarcerating, what our faith calls us to in response, and how we might uh, become to be uh, better accompaniers and better ministers in those spaces. Uh, and with that, uh, before we dive in, I'd like for us to open with prayer for a moment and mindful of the, the developments that are happening in Ukraine right now, I'd like for us to just take a moment, um, maybe to center yourselves, take a few deep breaths and we'll offer a prayer for peace in our time. O oh God, author and giver of peace, in whose image and likeness each of us has been created, with a dignity worthy of respect on earth and destined for eternal glory, listen to the cry that rises from every corner of this fragile earth, from our human family torn by violent conflict. Give peace in our time, O good and gracious God, that peace which, as your son Jesus Christ told us, and as we have experienced in these days, is a peace which the world cannot give. To world leaders grant the wisdom to see beyond the boundaries of race, religion, and nation, to that common humanity that makes us all your children and sisters and brothers to one another. To those who have taken up arms in anger or revenge, or even in the cause of justice, grant the grace of conversion to the path of peaceful dialogue and constructive collaboration. To the innocent who live in the shadow of war and terror, especially frightened children, be a shelter and strength, their haven and hope. And to those who have already lost their lives as victims of human cruelty and chemical warfare, Open your arms and enfold them all in the embrace of your compassion, healing, and everlasting life. Grant this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Mary, Mother of all, Queen of Peace, pray for us. Amen. Well, thank you all uh, for being here today. I'm going to share my screen here for a moment, and we'll go ahead and dive right in and uh, check out the, the landscape of things going forward for today. Um, so just uh, to set the intention for today, this is gonna be a brief, um, we'll have some brief overviews of each session uh, within the Lenten resource guide of within who do you say that I am? But today's uh, conversation is really so that we could have some open floor discussion, a town hall engagement about the content and the application of the content uh, in this resource guide. So I'm hopeful that we on the committee who helped create this, and then you, our partners in ministry, that we can have some back and forth amongst each other on how we can be creative with implementing this resource in our own communities. If you are looking for that more in-depth look at the resource, I'll point you toward the web our website where we have linked the webinar that we posted at the beginning of January, which takes a deeper dive into each of the sessions uh, in the guide. Uh, as we go along, certainly there'll be questions that you have or reactions that you might have. I encourage you to use the reactions button that is on the control panel for your Zoom, if that is something you're comfortable using. Um, and that will be helpful, particularly in when we're fielding questions during the Q&A sessions. So each session will we'll take a three to five minute overview of each session within the packet, and then we'll have a 10 to 12 minute Q&A open floor discussion. And as we're going through these things, uh, a question that might be helpful to continue to hold in your mind is, what do I need to implement this resource? What could be most helpful to, to bring this resource to my community? Um, and then before we dive right in uh, to a few of the standard pieces, which I'll go over here in a moment, I would like to encourage you, if you're so comfortable, to go ahead and turn your camera on. Uh, as this is a town hall, we want to be sure that we can see each other and interact as much as we can um, to sort of encourage that, uh, that sense of community as much as we can in a virtual space. So thank you for considering that. 
So a few of the standard pieces uh, that come with each of the sessions inside the resource guide. Each session opens up with a welcome, uh, an introductory statement of an overview of what that session will be about. Uh, then it will offer uh, some considerations for the space that the gr your groups might be inhabiting, you know, a, a space for you to talk about uh, where the bathrooms are, where you might find refreshments, how to respect the space, things along those nature. Um, and then also a, a reiteration of shared expectations. And we really want to encourage that not only it, uh, when you bring this resource to your communities, but also during our time to, uh, together here today, um, that we call, that we recognize we're all coming from uh, a space to share and to be open. And we all expect to be respected in our sharing and our openness, just as we would respect others um, in, in their thoughts and their questions and the experiences that they bring. Um, so setting the ground for those shared expectations today and also in the sessions when you offer them. And then each session will also have a general roadmap and then a survey link as well. And that survey is particularly important for Catholic Prison Ministries Coalition so that we can capture how people are engaging with this resource and it can inform next year's resource because this will be an annual thing that we put together. We wanna to make sure that we're providing resources that are impactful for you and for the communities that you're bringing it to. And then uh, each session will also have uh, resources and action uh, piece of the, of the session. Uh, how can we pray about this? What are some ways that we can advocate and learn? How can I volunteer and keep informed? And a lot of those pieces can be addressed by pointing toward the catholicprisonministries.org website or to the partners that you might bring in, your local organizations that you might bring in to share their stories when you, uh, when you use this, this guide. And then each session will also end with a looking ahead. Again, the survey piece, trying to capture people's reactions before and after each session. When will the, your next gathering will be? What will be covered? And any other general housekeeping considerations you might have. So with that, um, just wanted to ask if there are any questions about those standard pieces that are gonna be part of each session. And we'll, we'll dive into each session here in a moment. But any of the standard uh, pieces like me, they have the surveys, the welcoming, the sharing, the space, those types of things. Are there any questions in that realm? Cool. Okay, um, so then I'll go ahead and turn it back over to, to Harry and to Bill um, to give us a brief overview of session one and then we'll have a Q and A on it. Thanks, Jared. I'll go ahead and start and Harry will um, jump in um, to correct me on many things. I really like the idea of this session, Stats to Stories. And the reason for that is we can talk about statistics a lot, but without having that, that human face on those numbers, the numbers are very cold. We can use those numbers, however, to understand the basis of our prison system, how we view the offenders and, and what we do with them how long we might keep them incarcerated, how our rate of incarceration varies from other, from other countries. So it tells us a little bit about us, how we do that. As we go through those numbers, we can also take a look at how we treat the families, how we treat their friends. Not only do we incarcerate that, that individual, but we also put a burden on the family, the spouse and the children, as well as, as their friends there's a sort of a guilt by association. So what we wanna do is make sure that we understand it's not just looking at, at a crime, at what one particular person did and defining that person by that crime, but it's a person who committed that crime. And we wanna make sure that we remember that it's the person who's involved with that. So by walking through this program and taking a look at some of the numbers, what we're hoping you'll be able to do is, is understand a little bit more about the burdens that are carried, not only by that offender, but by the family and how those burdens can continue to be placed on those, those families from generation to generation because they lose that ability to move into better neighborhoods, move into better schools, move into a better um, you know, life. So that's a, that's a long, long thing for folks to carry. So it's that shadow of incarceration that impacts people throughout their lives. The other thing that we want to, 
to get out of that is the idea of that recidivism and how hard it is for us to help people reenter into society. And as it becomes harder and harder for them to reenter into it, then they end up going back and committing the same crimes again, or they go back to the same, same thing they were going for before. One of the ways that we wanted to, to take a look at how we can understand this is to take a look at different scenarios. So within the package, we have three scenarios put in, but that doesn't mean those are the only three. If you have people who are in your uh, group who might have some particular experiences, you can also, they can also bring those up as well. One thing I will say that when we go into the scenarios and that type of stuff, be cognizant that, that some people could be really impacted by this. There might be something they've lived through. It might be something they're struggling with. Some people might have to get up and walk out. Some people might have a very hard time expressing themselves. So please be open, be understanding, and give them some space to, to feel comfortable to be part of this discussion. The other thing I'll say about it is there is no right answer. Um, every person is gonna take a look at those scenarios and they're gonna give the response based on their experiences, based on their life journey, based on their age. Um, all of those factors will filter in on that. So you have to, to be open and really listen through it. But it's hopeful that, that we'll get through those scenarios and you'll get a better understanding of what those numbers mean that we talk about in the statistics and then what they mean from the human side. And I'll turn it over to Harry. And Harry, if you have some, some other words of wisdom. You know, I think what's important is that we realize that, uh, you know, the, the families of the incarcerated are affected in school and home and the community, and they become more aware of that. They're invisible. Their pain is often invisible to the rest of the community. So this is these scenarios were developed to help us to see behind that, that screen that hides them. Uh, and the packet, uh, I think it was page 18, suggested next steps for action so that people can continue to learn about the topic, especially looking at what local resources you might have to help them do so. So be sure you know what local organizations or ministries uh, help people uh, who are struggling with these stories and be sure that you uh, make that available to the participants. We provided a number of links to help you do that, both links to our own website and then links to our partners and what they do to help support those who have gone through this experience. And uh, with that, I think we should go to session two. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Um, and before we move on to the next session, just wanted to open up the floor uh, for any questions that people might have about the content in session one, concerns you might have about implementing those pieces or how that might look. And I see we've got a hand up with Robert over there. So Robert, why don't you kick us off? I'm, I'm really glad to hear this discussed. Um, up here in Milwaukee, we've been working for, uh, I'm gonna say three years to get a family circle of support going. Um, we tried uh, live stuff with uh, at our parish and working with one of the community organizations here. Um, and then we got COVID in. We weren't being very successful. We weren't getting people showing up. We backed off a little bit and then we started doing all sorts of this project return we work with, started doing circles. Um, on Zoom and uh, tried to get it out, tried to get it out. We actually have managed in the last few years to get a lot more cooperation, it's scary, uh, between all of the different people working on reentry and, and stuff, um, including the regional director for probation and parole and all sorts of other um, public defenders and prosecutors and judges and whatever. And we got the word out. And only in November did we finally get a small group of people to start coming. And it's a monthly thing. And, and they're coming back. Um, one of the biggest things is um, the shame families. One, uh, there's a deacon 
at our cathedral that also has a program and there's families that just um, don't want to stick their head out. Um, especially in an in-person, um, they definitely don't want to uh, go to something at their own parish because they'll see people they know. Um, we had some resistance from our principals or at our school because they, they didn't want to touch the subject. Um, but it's something uh, I've been convinced of uh, since I got off probation um, after watching what my wife went through with me. It's a critical need and it's critical to reentry. And it's critical to um, helping people in the reentry uh, stages to make sure they have a family support system. It's not going to become toxic because all of a sudden this person has re-entered the family. Um, I don't know. I'm going on a little bit, but this is this is something near and dear to my heart, and I'm really, really glad um, to see this included in a program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there other questions or ideas that people wanted to throw out there about how to use this first session in your in your local space? Patricia, I see your hand up over there. The um, scenarios are are like geared toward the family, um, but I was thinking maybe including something. At, there's so many that I deal with on reentry that have nobody, or the families have such limited resources they can't help them. You know, putting in something about that. Hmm. Sure. A lot of them lose people when they're in, when they're incarcerated. Mm -hmm. you know, so. we, we, that's a good, good, good point, Patricia, because we focused on the fact that we wanted to be sure we included those who had a good family connection who wanted to maintain it. But you're right. I think if you have, in fact, if you develop something from your own experience, please share that with us because that could be alternate scenarios for the future. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Patricia. Other thoughts or questions? Oh, Lawrence, I see your hand up down there. Right to it, but as far as that, um, that shame that comes from the, the re-entry process, there's really something about those old parables that are in the Bible, you know, the one of the prodigal son, you know, where he went off and squandered and then when he came back, he was really expecting to just be like, really like low. And his father ran out and showed him, you know, hey, you know what? You made some mistakes, you're back home and we appreciate you. You know, and that one brother was trying to like steal. But when he finally realized, you know what? This is what makes it work, you know, accepting someone that's been through those changes and learned from those changes and was able to transform and from that experience, they're able to even help others so, I mean, you know, just as, whatever we can do to lift that shame and make them know, you know, we're not holding it against you because we know society creates a whole lot of things that are really just beyond your control. You know, if you grew up in an area where there was poverty, miseducation, uh, weapons and drugs, and, you know, you got sucked into that, you know, and then when it comes back to, to, to the fact about the recidivism, you know, you really got to look at, uh, developing those kind of programs. Cause I was thinking like, if you had a, like if Amco, if every year, you know, that you had to take your car back to Amco, you'd put them out of business. You know, they call it the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation and people are recidivism. What are you guys doing with all that money that you're getting? You know, you've got to develop programs that gear people for release and you have to have something that shows them that they're being accepted, they're not being sanctioned. And just bringing them back into society. You know, I was fortunate, you know, to run into some good programs while I was in there. And also uh, when I got out, you know, to still keep connections. And it's made a, it's made a total difference in the, in the way that the things are going for me. Yeah. Thank you, Lawrence. Appreciate uh, you sharing that and speaking that out. Um, and you know, around the topic of shame, I'll call out uh, on our CPMC website. Um, there's a project we lifted up back, lifted up uh, back in October uh, called Holding Still. Um, 
that you all can, uh, Carol will pop that in the chat here in a moment. So you can check that out. And if shame is something you want to engage with, with the populations that you minister to, um, that is an excellent resource to, to engage with. And it, um, there's some men that share some stories about their experiences with shame while incarcerated. So I encourage you to look at that if that's something you're interested in. Um, all right. So yeah, I don't want to, yeah, if you have other questions around session one, please reach out. Uh, I'm just mindful of our time here trying to get through each session. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move on to session two. Um, so Erica, I will pass that on to you. Great. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I just, um, the only way we chip away at shame and other um, misconceptions of anything surrounded with the correctional system is to educate. And that's why we're all here today. So I love those questions. Um, so this is about, so now that we've talked about kind of real life stories of those involved in the incarceral system and how it impacts them, session two is really about what does our Catholic faith say about everyone impacted by the carceral system, whether they're a victim of crime, a family member, of a victim or somebody who's incarcerated, somebody who's incarcerated, et cetera. And so we used Catholic social teaching and um, for each Catholic social teaching, we put a, a, a piece of a story that went with it. So you can use it. And I would just encourage you, this, this is a very fluid process and how you wanna live it out. This, whether you're gonna be doing it online or in person, it just allows people to break up into smaller groups and to process um, at a, a more significant level and then bringing them back. Now, when you do this process, you might find that you don't have enough people to really break them up in groups. So then I would come together and just walk through the Catholic social teachings with them and have them process with you as a whole group. So it's really up to you how you wanna do the process. Um, and we also have a true and false exercise that really just helps name a statistics in a more entertaining way. Um, it sometimes our information can become dry. And so we tried to put it in a true false exercise to try to interact more with our participants. Um, and here were some of the prompts for the questions. So I'm giving you a very, very high level overview, but if you've had time to look at it, if you have any questions about it, but this, this particular section is very interactive. You really want to encourage your participants to dive into the Catholic, Catholic social teaching that we've developed um, and to really allow them time to process and ask questions um, and work through some issues because some people might have some significant issues. And there is this, you might um, sense some tension in these, these topics because our our Catholic faith teaches us to do one thing, um, but people are really struggling with this. They're coming to this conversation um, with different thoughts and different perspectives. And so it's just helping people see um, how people live within the um, incarcerated system and how and people are impacted about it. And then educating them from a Catholic perspective on how we really want to love and care for versus judge. And so going back to what Lauren said around the prodigal son, how do we um, kind of create new and work away at shame? So any questions about this? That was very, very high level. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Erica, I guess you killed it with, uh, you nailed it then. There aren't any questions on that one. <laughs> and if, if you have questions that come up uh, about a previous session as we're going along, please feel free to pop them in the chat. Uh, we'll, we'll save the chat afterward and respond to those questions too. Oh, I see you. Richard has his hand raised. Yes, thank you um, for uh, the opportunity to, to be with all of you and to, to listen to the uh, um, and be at this town hall. A question that I have for you um, in terms of um, those of you who are perhaps a little, have had some experience at dealing with this. Um, uh, I think, uh, Erica, you, you um, started to, to touch on it in a general way when you talked about people coming with different thoughts. But um, the Catholic social teachings um, can be code words uh, that are interpreted politically by some folks. 
-hmm. therefore, uh, they're not going to listen to um, or be reluctant to the mission if they think that um, that that's what we're doing. But uh, uh, first of all, has that been in anybody's experience? And then um, when if it is, uh, what what's a good way to to handle it and move people to um, the goals that we're trying to deal with in terms of this? Um, and for full disclosure, um, uh, I'm a, a moral theologian who's been uh, teaching uh, this material in Catholic seminaries and, and universities for about 40 years. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, and I've run into this in terms of with students, but I've never been in, uh, this is a new experience for me and I'm ex uh, excited about it. But anyway, I'm, uh, any thoughts, Erica or anyone else who's done this before, um, have we run into that and how do you deal with it? Richard, great question. And I just wrote you down as a future volunteer to help us with content. Yeah, you laugh. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's great to have you. Thank you for participating. I, um, I realize I went very high level over that, but I actually anticipate and you should anticipate that this conversation is going to be difficult and people are going to come to it um, politically from two very different perspectives. I think it depends on where each of you are at, um, even geographically. Um, and you know, most of you know who your audience will be. And um, if you're in a parish setting, if you're doing this within a correctional system, because I know some people are doing that as well. So I would anticipate maybe who potentially is your audience. Um, and I would expect some tension. And with that said, and I know this is hard in the church world, but I would invite it because we want people to come to the table and share authentically where they feel and where they stand with this topic. We don't want them to come and just um, be a pacifist and sit there and listen to, we want to hear their voice because that's how we help grow. And I, I think it's um, other people might have an idea of how to um, work through that conversation and through that dialogue. But I think we just have to be very open to varying opinions and then help bring in some of the statistics that we've created in this document to help guide the conversation. Does that help Richard? Uh, very... Yes, that's no, that that's good. Thank you. And I appreciate the fact that um, your comment is well received. We invite um, sometimes uh, we invite the conflict or at least invite the differing opinions. Um, and I think that's a rich uh, experience. I think uh, it, uh, a lot of it depends upon the skill of the facilitator uh, in terms of uh, dealing with that and how to have authentic comments, but in a way that doesn't lead uh, to a, a disruption of the focus. Um, the focus is always going to and needs to be on um, the incarcerated as the image of God um, and, uh, and the returning citizens. And so we don't want it to, to devolve into a uh, right versus left um, uh, argument, you know, so. Yep. It's anticipating, oh, sorry. Well, go ahead. No, sometimes from well, no. my experience as a teacher, I learned it doesn't hurt to remind them of the long history of this in the church. So that this isn't something, this isn't a recent thing that has a definite political connection. And that's, a, this is a long history of the church responding to how to affirm the dignity of everyone and so forth. So anyway, it, I found rooting it in that history helps them see, well, this isn't just me at this moment saying this. This has been the church's reflection on how to defend the dignity of all. So anyway, sorry, but Erica. If, if I can throw in from last Sunday, a priest friend of mine who is a former Old Testament scripture scholar professor from our seminary um, was giving a homily and he was tying in the whole theme of mercy and forgiveness. We're really good at asking for forgiveness, but not necessarily giving mercy. And, and he presented it in a gentle way. It worked. It was very powerful, but he didn't go into Catholic social teaching because up here in Wisconsin, yeah, that even in one congregation pulls us different directions. And he was able, and it, yeah, it is political, 
Uh, we're uh, working on uh, elections this spring uh, and, of course, next fall in Wisconsin, and we're very, very politically charged, um, so much so that our Assembly and Senate are putting in all sorts of bills. There was one guy was suggesting a bill that would automatically um, take away a parent's custodial rights for their children if they were convicted of any felony. They know these aren't going to go through. They're just throwing up all sorts of stuff because they're, um, you know, justice and, you know, tough on crime. Um, so sometimes if we, we have to fight that, but we can fight it maybe if we're not talking Catholic social teaching, but comparing Old Testament eye for eye and New Testament mercy and forgiveness. Um, so sometimes if we change just how we phrase things, instead of presenting it as a theologian talking about Catholic social teaching, um, I think that would help a lot. Um, I know that this one particular homily worked uh, quite well with that assembly. Thank you for that, Robert. And um, yeah, if, if you feel so comfortable uh, asking if the, the homilist has a transcription or a, a copy of that homily, we'd love to take a look at it and lift that up um, through some of our networks if, if, it, um, if that's, that's all right. Knowing um, Tom Suriano, he didn't, he knew what he was going to say, but <laughs> off the top of his head. Yeah, right, right. That's great. And, you know, I think what you're mentioning there uh, about the politicalness of it all is that's an, that's an avenue that we want to point out through each of these sessions is the advocacy piece, right? There are so many different ways for us to be politically active ad, advocating for those voices that have been marginalized in our communities, in our states, and at the, you know, at the federal level as well. And we have those, those links and throughout the guide there. And I, I encourage you to share those with um, the communities that you bring this resource to, to address that. Um, we'll take one more question from Kevin here, and then we'll move on to, to session three. I just wanted to uh, comment on, on Rob, what Robert was talking about. And I anticipate that we would get non-Catholics and Catholics that are, that are going through through this guide with us as participants. And it makes a lot of sense to, to base things on scripture the way Robert was talking about, because um, it would speak to non-Catholics and then also present the Catholic teachings as well on incarceration. So I just uh, appreciate what you said, Robert. Thank you for that, Kevin. Um, all right, so then with that, we're gonna, uh, before we jump on to session three, I just wanted to give uh, a shout out to Lawrence here on the call with us. Um, Lawrence was part of the, the Holding Still project back in the fall. Didn't want to call him out earlier until I checked in with him. Um, so just want to say thank you, Lawrence, for, uh, for being part of that project and lifting up the topic of shame. So appreciate you. Um, all right, we're going to dive into session three here with uh, Daisy and Karen. Hi, everyone. Um, well, you, I think you've heard this. We've mentioned of it uh, here from my colleagues and from uh, um, everyone who has been participating in this discussion, but I, I think it's worth repeating and just reading the whole quote from Brian Stevenson from Just Mercy and, and the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, he said, each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. And because of that, there's this basic human dignity that must be respected by law. Um, when I think about session three, I think it really speaks to that concept by introducing restorative justice, a tool that kind of helps us to see the person, not the crime committed. Um, thank you. <laughs> restorative justice might be a new phrase for people. So I think maybe a, a good way to start is connecting it to session two, um, showing how the values of Catholic social teaching connects to restorative justice. Um, it provides a platform to explore with the group how restorative justice is aligned with our faith, which calls us to forgive and heal. Um, you know, I know we were just talking about the fact that not everybody who participates maybe is Catholic. Um, and I think restorative justice, regardless of whether you speak about Catholic social teaching or not, really at the end of the day is all about 
allowing voices to be heard, allowing for accountability to take place, allowing for there to be a, a community response to how healing will take place. So um, it's really a, a, a platform that really allows for, um, for, for that type of connection and relationships to take place. Um, so, and I think you will find that in the guide, there are plenty of resources that help you dig, to dig a little deeper into restorative justice. Um, and one of the ways that they do that is, is that the guide provides is also exercises that help you to put restorative just, justice into place so that all in your group can really see how um, a restorative circle might work. Um, and I, I'm gonna pass it on to Karen, who is gonna talk about restorative circles. Make sure I'm on. Um, yeah, we could not miss the opportunity to introduce circle, the circle process. And I was thrilled to hear, you know, Robert, you made reference to it even on Zoom, which it's been widely used. And it's a it's a it's a process and it's a technique, and it's a practice. And uh, it's all it's it's kind of all of those. And we wanted it the organizations to use it. It's got a wide variety of, of ways that circle process can be used but just an opportunity for people to experience it and to be able to come together, slow down and to be uh, interactive in part of this, in part of this process. You know, there's, um, I'm hearing throughout all of these and in your comments and stuff, this awareness of trauma and shame. And there's just not an opportunity. Society doesn't provide it. Families don't provide it. Most families don't provide it. An opportunity to really sit with it, get in touch with it and to have a safe, space to be able to process it. So it's, it's teaching people how to create a safe space. And that, you know, that onus is going to be initially on the uh, facilitator. And we have websites, we have webinars specifically on the circle process that you can access on our website uh, to, to dive into that about, you know, setting, making the, the um, scenario uh, with the centerpiece and just the ambience and how to set things. So we'll go into that. But I just wanted to um, say that this was created intentionally just so that we could have this opportunity of circle. And then by doing so, um, provide stories and show how circle has been used and how it is a restorative practice that needs to be introduced into our churches, into our families, but definitely into our carceral system. And so it's a way of having all voices heard. And as Daisy mentioned, an opportunity for um, the accountability, but also, a, you know, a process of having a safe space where somebody is built up, lift up, and share their story, and the, commun the community can decide on how uh, the retribution takes place. So um, uh, it, I'm going to just leave it at that and then open it up for questions because circles uh, is a whole other issue, and this is restorative justice is... Um, it's also got to be a word that's gotten kind of hijacked. <laughs> it's from social justice into marriage counseling all the way to it's used for everything now, smeared around. And so, uh, but we wanted to, to give them an opportunity to just get an overview of what it is and then the many ways it can be used. And the circle is a practice and a way to um, experience it. Great, thank you, Karen. I wanna open up the floor. Um, for any questions or thoughts on session three um, that you might have. Do most people have an experience of circle? I'm just curious about that, especially as facilitators. I, I hesitate because I feel like I'm talking too much, but uh, we have, we had actually started um, my parish um, had started working with probation and parole uh, to do restorative justice circles. This was this is separate from the family circle, and they had been doing them in person. They had somebody that was an experienced facilitator, and probation and parole suggested um, people that had just returned uh, to come to the circle. And we had parish members who were supportive, community, we had community resources. 
and we would sit and we would do the circle process um, and questions, you know, were, okay, what was your impact on the community? What do you want to do in the future? Um, and, you know, it was, it, it was kind of a one and done circle. They didn't come back. Uh, we're talking about getting it going again. And this time we're talking about an ongoing circle. Um, but it involved people from our parish community too. So it wasn't just, you know, we're going to fix you to the returning people. It was something that was a sharing that then, you know, did kind of slip out into the rest of the um, parish community a little bit. Um, tough going, but it, it's, it's a process I'm convinced is good. Thank you for sharing that, uh, that experience, Robert. Um, it's an example of some of the impact these practices can have and that they call us back to, right? And the, the power of those things. Are there other thoughts or, or questions or suggestions um, for the restorative justice session? Um, I know you're using it very much so. It just the page. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, well, we're, yeah, we're trying to incorporate more of um, restorative justice practices into our reentry program, especially. Um, and we're kind of in the process of working on that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a great process from what I've seen. I, I will say that um, not only for this session, but for the previous sessions too, um, in combination with the, the participants guide, the, the facilitators PowerPoint also has extensive notes on how you might implement some of these, um, these reflections, some of these uh, practices to help you feel a little more comfortable in, in implementing these pieces. So if you're not familiar with the power with PowerPoint notes, the notes underneath the PowerPoint slide, please feel free to reach out to us. I'm, we're happy to, to give you a little direction on how to find the notes section on that. Um, but that should really uh, help help you feel more comfortable in, um, in leading some of these discussions and reflections. We tried to do our best to, to make it a, a handout ready to go and implement right away sort of piece. Um, and then, you know, something to think about uh, if, if there is a topic or a session in here that you're not as comfortable with, we really do encourage, and we've created space, you'll, you'll notice that in the notes, we've created space for you to invite people from your local community uh, into, the, into your reflection spaces, into these sessions, to share their story. You know, whether that's someone who's a staff member at a St. Vincent de Paul or a Catholic Charities, or maybe it's someone who is, has recently uh, returned from incarceration. Uh, you know, people who you obviously want to be, to be careful in, in asking if those people feel comfortable sharing their stories and in what way you want to be respectful of, of some of those traumas that they've experienced and some of their experiences. Um, but then also let's not forget that chances are the person sitting next to you in church or at work has somehow been touched by incarceration in some way, uh, whether that's through a family member or a friend, you know, the statistic is one in two Americans have, you know, one, maybe two degrees of separation from being touched by incarceration. So I, uh, you know, I just want to make sure we name a little bit more space here for any questions that people might have um, otherwise uh, from the implementation of these sessions or any su suggestions or guidance you might have for anyone else that's here. Yes, uh, can we hear a little bit more about um, uh, what, um, what, Karen, you alluded to briefly about um, uh, using uh, Zoom uh, as the element for the circles, um, because uh, Perry Henry and I are preparing to do some uh, work uh, with this uh, resource guide, um, and we're going to be doing uh, all the sessions online for the Vincentians of the Western United States. Um, so um, interested in any thoughts about uh, how to um, do the circles and break them up? How do you do it without a, um, 
a, um, a, a, a trained facilitator? Should we uh, even attempt it? Uh, but anyway, thoughts, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah, circle could be done be done in Zoom. I mean, you know, it's a matter of now, uh, I don't know how many you're having on there and if you're going to have to break them into groups. And if you are, then, you know, there's, there's simple instructions you can give to your, quote, uh, lead in the group. And, and that is, is that, you know, just doing a warm up round is a good practice, you know, as far as for them. And as they name them off on their screen and let them know that we're, they're going to be, um, have an opportunity, everyone will have an opportunity to speak. They don't have to present that they can pass and that they will be circled back around to. And the facilitator can lead off by just naming the people as they go on their screen and putting their names in the chat as a listing. So it's a kind of like a cue for the person, you know, when they, uh, so they know when the quote virtual talking piece is going to be passed to them and uh, they'll have an opportunity to speak. But it is, um, <clears throat> is kind of opening it, opening it in prayer. Now with these scenarios, it's gonna be, you're basically going to create, you're gonna, it's gonna be a little more difficult. You're gonna have, you have your people that are, are gonna be, um, you may have to pre-assign some people and do it as a whole and just create a virtual circle in the middle of, of these assigned um, personalities and they, as they assume their roles. And then they do a talking circle and moderate it in, while you have everybody else watching. So um, that will take a little bit more uh, planning than a virtual circle that, you know, if they're doing, if you're doing any kind of other virtual breakout groups, it's easy. You just have a facilitator in each group and then they moderate and they lead. Uh, and as you know, as you always ask them, is that they model the answer to the question, making it succinct so that they, you know, they're very time aware and they're part of the timekeeper. Uh, and there's gentle ways to, to, uh, to use your reactions to, to move people along if their time is up or if they've taken too much time to talk. Uh, so there's a lot of Zoom, cute, Zoom techniques you can use just to facilitate a circle, but it is gonna take a little bit more artistic work for the, this session. Thank you, that's very helpful. If, if you're a professor, you've already done it. Yes. <laughs> um, you, you know, the circle facilitator, it, you remember, you know, small groups, um, just small group collaboration that we use in the church for um, all sorts of renew programs. Okay, I'm dating myself 30 years ago. It's not much different as far as what you're actually doing. The techniques in Zoom, like Karen said, there's all sorts of cute things and ways to do it. And you have to learn how to um, assign people to breakout groups and bring them back. Um, but Zoom has several different um, videos and coaching things uh, that would help you do it. But if you've been teaching that long, yeah, you're a small group facilitator anyway, so it works. Yeah. And uh, Father Perry and, and uh, Richard, you know, as you're putting those things together and sharing those with your, your West Coast um, St. Vincent de Paul Associates, please share that work with us. We love to lift it up as you're doing it you know, through our social media channels and those things so that other people can see the, how you've adapted it for your space. And perhaps people can glean something from that as well. Yeah, Patricia. Um, I was going to say the Catholic Mobilizing Network, um, I would go on to their website. We just did an intro um, to restorative justice with peace circles, and they did the peace circles with us. It was a basic beginning. I found it very informative and the way they did it. I just recommend taking a view with that. I think that will help help you get an idea of, of how you want to form things. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Uh, Patricia, happy. what did you say was the uh, resource? It's the Catholic Mobilizing Network. And it was an intro to restorative justice. And they just did this the other week that I participated in it. So there should be a recording out there now. 
We'll send you the link with the follow up for this. They are a partner for the coalition. Um, and they, they, they have many resources on this. Yeah. If you flip to the back uh, page or two of the resource guide, there's a direct link to their website there, as well as a description of the work they do. Kevin, I see your hand up over there. Yeah, I just thought I'd add that we've done some Zoom things with groups in the past, and it's really helpful to have a facilitator just manage the Zoom. And you probably understand, uh, come to this uh, idea anyway, but, you know, the facilitator should facilitate and just have one person assigned to handle technical issues on the Zoom. And then you don't have to think about that kind of stuff. Somebody else will take care of it as problems come up. They can respond to the person and things like that. I just thought I'd add that. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, well, we are nearing the end of our time here together. I have a few uh, CPMC commercials coming up, but before we dive into those, I just wanna say this isn't the end of the conversation. If you have other questions about implementation, you know, please feel free to reach out. If there's someone on here that you want to, uh, someone uh, amongst our community here that you'd like to hear more from, you know, I'm happy to connect you afterward directly with that person as well, if that's something that um, is agreeable to both parties um, so that we can continue to, to, to network and lift up best practices um, so that we can do this work that we're called to and do it well and educate um, and, and serve in a company. Um, so with that, um, I'll ask Kara to go ahead and share screen here. We've got a few events coming up um, here at the end of the month and into the month of March. Um, so first here on March 3rd, there will be the spiritual exercises while incarcerated. We invite you to learn about using the Ignatian spiritual exercises in your ministry through this town hall presentation with Father Zach Prosciutti, a uh, Jesuit from Thrive for Life. And then on March 9th, uh, join us for a, a webinar titled Prayer and Sacred Story. It'll be a discussion about prayer and the concept of sacred story with Father Bill Watson, also a Jesuit. He will share about the, his book, Mercy, a Sacred Story, and his correspondence with Richie Roman, a man who is incarcerated for 25 years of, for federal armed bank robbery. Uh, Father Bill will also talk about uh, a framework for faith reflection communities in prison with, those, uh, with the help of outside correspondents. And then coming up on March 17th, we have a town hall that's going to explore the Francisco Homes program out in LA, which provides re-entry support and transitional housing services to formerly incarcerated individuals in the South LA area. And this presentation will be led by David Schwed and Sister Teresa Groff. Um, so those are a few of the uh, things we have coming down the pike. Those links will be popped down into the chat. Um, and then you can also find them on our homepage as well on our front scroller there or on the town hall and webinar pages. Um, so with that then, um, I'll go ahead and share screen here and I'm gonna invite Daisy uh, of our education packet committee to go ahead and close us in a prayer that she authored herself and is included in the packet. Thanks, Jared. God of healing, we place ourselves in your hands as we, as we ask for compassion and healing. We pray for all who are experiencing conflict in their hearts, may they find restoration. All who are wounded physically, mentally, and spiritually, that they find the healing needed for peace. All who seek forgiveness, that they receive it. All who feel loss, that they find the light of hope. All who are angry, that the spirit of peace may rest in them. All who, are, all who feel alone, that they know we are here with open arms. All who seek the healing of damaged and broken relationships, that they find comfort. All of us who are present here, that you help us accompany those in need. God of restoration, we humbly pray these things to you so that you so that we can walk together in the path of healing and justice. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daisy. And thank you all for being here today. Uh, don't be strangers. Please reach out if you have any other questions and ways that we can support you in using this resource. We'll see you all soon. Thank you.